Log Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. I want to welcome all of you back to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. We are in the Billy Meyer case. I've jumped over to Contact 215. We're going to be talking about the Sabra and the Shatila massacre, which occurred around 1982. Uh, There were about 3,000 civilian killed, mostly Palestinians who were in Lebanon at that time. The reason this killing took place is it was supposed to be paybacks for the assassination of the president of Lebanon. Lebanon is north of Palestine. So this Christian militia went in and killed about 3,000 people. Quetzal's telling Billy about this, and the contact occurred on Saturday, February 28, 1987. I'll go ahead and start this clip, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy this. I want to turn to Ellen Siegel. She was a Jewish-American nurse who worked at a hospital at the Sabra camp at the time of the Sabra and Shatila massacre in September 1982. Uh, we interviewed her in 2001 and played it on the 20th anniversary of the killings. She described some of what she witnessed during the massacre. The 18th. Um, which was a Saturday morning. It was also the first day of Rosh Hashanah. Um, We were told to come down to the the entranceway to the hospital, that the Lebanese army was downstairs. Well, it wasn't the Lebanese army, it was the Falange. And here were a group of of soldiers who looked looked quite neat, uh, clean, um, and they told us that they were going to march us out of the camp, and they took our passports from us, and they started to march us down the main street of the hospital. As we were marching, we saw dead bodies. Um, they started to holler at us, this uh, militia telling us that we were not Christian, that we came to help people who hated Christians, that we were terrorists, um, they were talking on walkie-talkies. There was constant communication with someone. There was um, there was a Palestinian who had been working in the hospital who did not flee when the rest of them did, and he was terrified, and he asked for someone to give him a lab coat, and so we gave him a lab coat. But, of course, he was picked out immediately because he looked very different than these white and blonde and... Scandinavian and American and British health workers, and um, I, I turned around. I saw him on his knees pleading, and I was told to keep walking. And the next thing I heard was a shot. I never looked back. As we continued walking, there were new soldiers. There was a whole contingent of other soldiers lining the streets, and these militia people looked quite crazed. They were looked very dirty, um, very messy, and looked like they. They had been on drugs or something. They were just um, tense, uh, wide-eyed, nervous, extremely nervous. There was a group of um, Palestinians and Lebanese refugees who they forced to line up against. A, they were all just lined during this pathway. And one of the women had an infant in her hands, and she tried to give this infant to one of the doctors. Um, and the phalange said, no, you can't can't take this baby and they were watching us and they were giving us the v sign it was hard to tell who was more uptight about what was going to happen to who as we continued down this street um we uh, there was a an area that had been part of the camp and suddenly there were there was bulldozers with an israeli with the hebrew letter on it and it was going back and forth, back and forth. That, I'm sure, turned out to be the mass grave. Um, we were, we kept on walking, walkie-talkies. We reached the end of the camp, and we turned a corner. This was outside of the camp. They lined us up against a bullet-ridden wall, and they um, had their rifles ready. And we really thought that this, I mean, it was a firing squad. Suddenly, an Israeli soldier comes running down this street and halts it. Um, I suppose the idea of, of 
gunning down foreign health workers was something that was not very appealing to the Israelis. But the fact that they could see this and stop it um, shows that there was there was some communication. That was Ellen Siegel, a Jewish American nurse who was working at Gaza Hospital in the Sabra camp at the time of the Sabra and Shatila massacre in 1982. I asked her what should happen to Ariel Sharon. I think what should happen to him is what has happened in our history, in Jewish history. Um, ever since I was a child, I have learned that what happened during the Holocaust happened because people were silent, people did not speak up, people allowed bad things to happen to other people and did not do anything about it. We should be the last people on earth that should allow that to happen. Simon Wiesenthal continues and the Jewish agencies continue to look for Nazi war criminals and indeed they should and bring them to justice. Ariel Sharon is a war criminal, and the legal aspects of this, um, I, am, I understand as a non-legal person, put him in that category. He allowed innocent people to be murdered. He did nothing to protect it. He knew that they were the sworn enemy of the Palestinians, and so he should be tried. That was Ellen Siegel, the nurse who worked in the Sabra camp at the time of the massacre in 1982. Professor Rashid Khalidi, also with us, your relative headed that hospital called Gaza Hospital? Correct. That Ellen Siegel my, worked in? My cousin Aziza was the director of Gaza Hospital at the time. And you were in Lebanon. He I was, was in there. at the time. Describe um, the reaction afterwards, how, what he was doing at that time. What my cousin, Aziza, what she was doing at the time. What she was doing. Uh, well, she was trying to stay alive. Um, first of all, they were treating patients uh, as victims of the massacre came in. Um, and then, as Ellen describes, uh, uh, only critically injured patients there at the time. They were trying to clear precisely, out precisely, precisely. And, and most people realized that a massacre was going on, and most of the Palestinians fled. Uh, my cousin was completely traumatized, uh, obviously, by it. As for that matter, were my children and thousands and thousands of other Lebanese and Palestinian children who were living in in Beirut uh, during the ten-week siege of the city, bombardment and siege of the city. Um, uh, one of the things that nobody has talked about is the new documents that have been revealed uh, in the Israel State Archives, which I think pin direct responsibility uh, for much more of what happened in Sabra and Shatila on not only Ariel Sharon and the Israeli government, but uh, uh, reveal American responsibility for what happened. Um, the New York Times, uh, on the 30th anniversary of the massacre, September of, 19, of 2012, published an op-ed with links to some of these documents uh, by a student of mine, actually. Uh, which shows that, in fact, Sharon's responsibility was far greater than indirect. Shows that the Israeli government knew perfectly well what was going on. That the Israelis stonewalled to prevent uh, the massacre being stopped. Uh, American diplomats were sent to tell the Israelis on the 16th of September, in the middle of the massacre, you must withdraw your forces from Beirut. And one can read in these documents, which the New York Times has put a link to on their website, exactly how Sharon uh, basically fended that off so that the killing could continue for another day. What was Israel's goal in Lebanon? The pretext was an assassination attempt on Israel's ambassador in London and the shelling of northern Israel. Right. Well, London. the shelling had been stopped for a year. Uh, ambassador Philip Habib, since 1981, had stopped the cross-border exchanges. So that pretext was removed, and Sharon was dying for a pretext. Uh, we have now uh, the text of his meeting with uh, Secretary of State Haig in May, and he lays out his objectives. He says, we're going to turn Lebanon into a uh, satellite state, much as Avi and, and, and Noam Chomsky said. Uh, we are going to eliminate Syrian influence, and we're going to destroy the PLO. Those were his objectives. And uh, he, uh, exactly as Professor Schleim said, sold this to the Israeli cabinet by, and to the Americans by saying it would be a much more limited operation. In fact, he intended to reach Beirut, and he intended to do all of these quite ambitious things to change the entire map. We're going to break, then come back to this discussion. We're talking about the death of Ariel Sharon. We're talking about his life and legacy, the former general and former prime minister of Israel. Stay with us. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for watching this report from Democracy Now!, your daily independent global grassroots news hour. We don't accept advertising or corporate funding, but rather rely on donations from viewers like you. Please make your contribution by visiting democracynow.org today. We need your support today to keep bringing you this hard-hitting, in-depth reporting.
Well, that was a clip about the Shabra and Satilla massacres. And the reason I'm talking about this is because it's covered in Contact 215, contact which occurred between Billy and a player and man named Quetzal. Quetzal at that time was the commander of all of the player and uh, stations in our solar system. And Quetzal stated that there were about 3,468 people who lost their lives in this massacre. And the culprits were the Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin and the Defense Minister Ariel Sharon. So anyway, this is a strange massacre that occurred in the Middle East back in 1987. It was condoned by Menachem Begin and Ariel Sharon, who, if you remember back in contact, I think it was contact 150 or 155, Billy and Quetzal both said these two men are, are pretty much war criminals, as the person in the clip even described. Um, I'm going to kind of take a detour, jump out of contact 215, and talk a little bit about some information that's coming out of Switzerland now from the the FIGU group there. One of the things they're warning us about is this man named Abu Bakr el-Baghdadi. He is now the leader of this group called ISIS. He was released from prison in 2009, and he's gotten the nickname of the ghost. And you're going to hear on the next clip a journalist named Jürgen Todenhofer, a German journalist who traveled to Mosul in Syria. And he stated that there's a dictatorship going on in Syria right now and some very strange things going on. 130,000 Christians have been forced to leave Syria. Many other groups have been killed. Only the Sunnis remain in the city. The Sunnis are one group of Islam. And then Todenhofer here has interviewed uh, some of the people who are the fighters in ISIS who claim that they're going to go to Rome, to uh, Britain, eventually to the United States. And there are actually people coming to join ISIS, to join this uh, terrorist group. So anyway, let me play this next clip. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this special edition of the program. I'm Fred Pleitkin, in for Christian Amanpour, coming to you tonight from Munich in Germany. There's been some progress recently in the fight against ISIS, with Kurdish forces making headway in northern Iraq. However, ISIS remains entrenched, both in Iraq as well as in Syria, and very little is known about its inner workings and also how high morale is among its fighters. Now, the German author Jürgen Todenhofer has managed to get access to ISIS both in Iraq and in Syria. He's a former German politician who now travels the world trying to understand the conflicts of our times. Tonight, for the first time, you're going to be able to listen to the interviews he conducted and see the video he filmed. Jürgen Todenhofer, welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us. Hi. ISIS is an organization that a lot of people obviously hate, a lot of people fear, but very few people know anything about. Their leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, has only been seen once in a mosque in Mosul. You were there as well. What was it like when you went there? It was a little mosque, and I got a lot of trouble because I wasn't allowed to enter. And I've been criticized, and we had a hard dispute about that. I wasn't allowed to go there because I was only a Christian. What's life like under ISIS? What's life like for the people in Mosul? Because that was the main place that you visited. Life seems to be normal. I say seems. Normal like life is in totalitarian countries under dictatorships. But if you say seems to be normal, it means that you have to know that 130,000 Christians have been forced to leave, that an incredible number of Shias have been forced to leave and have been killed, that the Yezids have been killed, and that only the Sunnis are still in this city. So I think after 
one week you cannot say how life really is. I've been in Mosul 11 years ago, but I must say, because I have to tell you the truth, it looked like 11 years ago. Without this plurality with Christians and Shias, which was the, also the charm of this city. One of the things that um, people there seem to at least appreciate about this totalitarian leadership that you're talking about there is that the police force seems to work, is that the daily life seems to work. Is that the impression that you got? How are things organized? Uh, is the Islamic State, as it calls itself, building state institutions there? It works like many states in this area especially in the field of law and order, of course, but this is very important for these people who have been discriminated by a Shia government, which was discriminating and, and killing also uh, the, Shia, the Sunni population. And uh, for many Sunnis, I think many Sunnis, moderate Sunnis don't like the radical IS Sunnis but they prefer them to the Shia government they had before. So they had a choice to make, if they wanted to be discriminated by Shias or if they want to live with IS. And I have the impression that there is no resistance against IS in the Sunni population. And I know the Sunni population very well because I spent in 2007 during the war against the United States a lot of time with these moderate Sunnis and they told me exactly the same. The fighters seem to be very confident, they seem to be very proficient and, uh, and very successful on the battlefield. And we're going to take a look at an interview that you did with uh, an ISIS fighter in Mosul. It took you how many days to conquer Mosul? About four days. We did not kill all 24 of them. We killed a fewer number, but they got terrified and ran away. We did not retreat. God has promised us victory. We must fight. And you think that you will win the war all over Iraq and Syria? Are you sure? We are certain that God will bring us victory and that all countries will be conquered. We will get to Rome, Istanbul, and even the United States. We are certain of that. On TV, we see um, beheadings. We see people being enslaved. How much of that did you see when you were there? I didn't see that, but this is horrible for me too. I saw these videos too. But these beheading videos are a part of the strategy of IS to make fear and terror in the field of the enemies. And that is, this is one of the reasons why the enemies run away when the fighters of IS arrive. It's a clear strategy and I had every day long discussions with them because I said, you know, I have read the Quran. I know Islam. Islam is a religion of mercy. But where is your mercy? And they answered, there's no time for mercy now. We prefer that our enemies fear us. Why so would, the, why would the local population rise up against that though? How can, how can they live under something like that? The Sunni Because they're not, they're not radical. The, the, the Sunnis of Iraq are not radical people. Yeah, but the Sunnis of Mosul and the Sunnis of the province of Anbar are moderate, but they have nothing to fear from IS. They accept IS and IS is helping them, is providing food and things for the poor people of Mosul. So that's not the problem. IS is a huge problem for all the other religions, for Shias. And this is, for me, there, there are the two points which were very, very hard to understand for me. The first point was this incredible enthusiasm of these fighters and this huge amount of young people who arrive every day, 50, 100, 150, from the United States, from all over the world, even from New Jersey, you know. You, you met you, people from New Jersey, you yeah. saw people from New Jersey. You, you, you don't suppose a young boy from New Jersey fighting for IS. 
I met the, the last fighter I, I spoke to was a guy from an island near the United States. I don't want to mention it because I don't want to make problems for his family. He just passed his law exam with a brilliant mark and he just got a, a great job offer and he refused this job offer because he wanted to fight for the Islamic State. They believe that they do something great, something historical, something good. They've also taken a lot of prisoners, of course, not just women, but also fighters. And we're going to look at an interview clip now that you did, because you were able to actually meet a prisoner of war as well. What did they tell you? What will happen to you? Uh, Our captor said that we have Islamic State fighters imprisoned with the Kurdish regional government. You are prisoners here and we will trade you back for our fighters. They didn't say they will kill or slaughter. What did you feel when you talked to that man? I felt incredibly sad because he was so weak. He said, I'm so grateful that you speak to me. And then I realized that hundreds of people were arriving to watch this situation and I stopped the conversation. This man was completely broken and uh, very sad situation. I mean, it's, it's very possible that he was tortured and subjected to other sorts of abuses. I don't know. I will not talk about uh, things I suppose. I think the only reason why he's not yet killed is because he could be exchanged against IS fighters. The way that the West is trying to react to the Islamic State is a mix of a bombing campaign, arming moderate rebels, Syrian rebels, and also trying to get some sort of Sunni uprising going on in Iraq. Do you think that that has any chance of winning from what you see no. with the Islamic State? Why? No. No. The first reason is why is because IS is powerful. They are very, very strong. You see, I don't like them, but they are strong. I had to admit that these people are strong. You, you saw this interview with a, new, a young fighter in Mosul. They were 400. They won the battle against 25,000 soldiers and militias. 400 or less than 400. These are very strong people. That's the one reason why I'm pessimistic and I think bombarding has been always the wrong strategy. You, you say they're strong. What, how can you win without bombing them? How do you want to bomb them? They stay in Mosul. 5,000 fighters live in Mosul. Everybody in another house. They don't stick together. They don't travel in convoys. I traveled with them, but never in a convoy. There was a lorry between us and the second car was far away. Nobody sticks together. They live in different houses and they live in Mosul, a city with three million residents. And to kill 5,000 IS fighters, you would have to destroy the whole city and to kill hundreds of thousands of civilians. That's not a strategy and it will not work. The only way to fight down IS is to fight them down with moderate Sunnis. Only the moderate Sunnis Sunnis can win a battle against the radical IS and they did it. In 2007 there was also an Islamic State in Iraq and this Islamic State in Iraq called ISI was fought down by this moderate Sunnis. But at this time the IS was not that strong. But that was with the Americans telling the, the moderate Sunnis that they, they would get government jobs afterwards, they yeah. would be integrated into the Iraqi security forces, none of that happened. We're, we're a no, lot further they, along They now. felt threatened, yeah. And, but it's, it, would be the, a little, it would be in a certain sense the same strategy. So I say the Western countries cannot fight down IS, only Arabs can fight down IS and only Sunni Arabs can fight IS. And the Sunnis will only fight against IS if they are reintegrated in the country of Iraq. They are completely discriminated. And this one, is... One group that you're not talking about is the FSA right now. The, the moderate they, Syrian they, they are laughing about the FSA. 
they don't take them for serious. They say the best arms seller we have are the FSA. If they get a good weapon, they sell it to us. And they didn't take them for serious. They take for serious Assad. They take for serious, of course, the bombs. But they fear nobody. And FSR doesn't play any role. We're going to talk a lot more about ISIS's strategy, about their long-term goals. We'll have more from Jürgen Todenhofer, who's just visited the Islamic State in just a moment. Started out the show talking about uh, a massacre called the Sabra and the Shatila massacre, which occurred in 1982 in Lebanon, where about 3,000 Palestinians were massacred by a militia close to this party called the Khatib Party. Uh, then I kind of taken a bit of a tangent into modern times here where we have the rise of this group called ISIL uh, in Syria right now. The people in Switzerland are saying the man in charge of ISIS now, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, is the man that was called the rat catcher or, or the pied piper in the prophecies in the Meyer material. Um, one prophecy talked about the pied piper back in 1995 in Contact 251. Contact 215, which I started out the show talking about, occurred in 1987. And in this contact, Billy is talking to Quetzal a player and man who was a king of wisdom and who was the commander of all of the player and stations in our solar system at that time, this Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is funded by people in Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and probably as well people in the West, possibly even our own government. The group... Billy's group, the FIGU in Switzerland, are really saying that this ISIL group is extremely dangerous and will be a real threat in days to come. I have another clip here that talks about the rise of ISIL. So let's listen to this. I think we've got a little bit of dead air at the beginning of this clip. But uh, This report contains graphic images... Go. Your discretion is highly advised. There is a power moving through the desert of Syria and Iraq faster than any invading army or sandstorm. Their influence and wealth grow by the day. Their acts of extremism and terror grow by the hour. Join me, Avi Oren, as we explore the Wahhabi terrorist group known as ISIS, the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant, in this special edition of American Empire. a state of emergency after hundreds of gunmen took control of strategic parts of the northern city of Mosul. Our senior international correspondent Nick Robertson tracking this story from Doha in Qatar for us. And Nick, a stunning defeat for government forces, but really it hasn't come from nowhere. It's been building for months from Anbar in the west to Samarra, Bukaba and Baghdad, now Mosul. ISIS is a former affiliate with the terrorist network Al-Qaeda, who supported ISIS in Syria and Iraq until recently. The aim of ISIS is to install a caliphate, a Sunni region of Syria and Iraq where they can impose Sharia law and rule as its government. Although ISIS officially formed in 2007 as the Al-Qaeda affiliate ISI, the Islamic State of Iraq, they can trace their roots back to the invasion of Iraq by U.S. forces in 2003. They achieved their notoriety during the civil war in Syria, where they now control hundreds of square miles of territory and villages. After amassing manpower, money, and weapons caches, ISIS now rivals the size, scope, and funding of many nations' armies. ISIS already controls vast amounts of land, military bases, including former U.S. bases, and major cities across Iraq and shows no sign of stopping. Although ISIS began its major combat operations in Syria in 2011, it has now begun its assault on Iraq. An Iraqi city where some of the fiercest fighting took place in the early years of the Iraq War, 
is now in the hands of forces linked to al-Qaeda. Insurgents have seized Fallujah in western Iraq. This is the worst violence against the Iraqi government since U.S. forces left the country in December of 2011. In January 2014, a devastating force moved into the city of Fallujah, Iraq, and took control from the Iraqi government. Iraq's Ambar province was the scene of a bloody three-way war between ISIS, local tribes, and the Iraqi security forces for control of the city. During the chaos, ISIS stormed into the city and by nightfall on January 3, 2014, had raised its black flag on government buildings in Fallujah. Before that, Ambar province was the scene of some of the deadliest combat U.S. forces faced since the Vietnam War. An estimated one-third of the 4,486 U.S. deaths in Iraq were caused by al-Qaeda in Iraq, the main militant movement that would later spawn ISIS almost a decade later. Fallujah was then used as a staging ground for what can only be compared to as a blitzkrieg by ISIS forces six months later after its fall. The capture of Fallujah made headlines around the world, only to quickly fall by the wayside and into obscurity of the mainstream media and American social consciousness. We now have the full autopsy results for actor Paul Walker. The report shows the Fast and Furious star did not have drugs or alcohol in his system when he died in a fiery crash in November. Frozen's billion dollar box office. Disney's Frozen is officially the highest grossing animated movie of all time. Iron Man, box office gold. Iron Man 3 remains in first place at the box office for the second week, earning $72.5 million. So what does it tell us? It tells us, one, the plane took off. It tells us where it went, the direction, and tells us that it was missing. So that's like the duh factor of that this That is report. the duh factor. In the six months since the capture of Fallujah, over 7,500 Iraqis have died in the sectarian violence heavily led by Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and other Wahhabi militias. Since the capture of Fallujah, ISIS has blazed a path across the Iraqi desert, taking the cities of Mosul, Baji, Tikrit, Samarra, and are heading towards the cities of Jalula with Baghdad as its ultimate goal. This is not good, though. It's not good. Yeah. And, and it's interesting, though, too, as we're going to talk about Mosul and Tikrit, obviously on the way potentially to Baghdad. You say it's less about speed and more about momentum. It really is. You know, when you talk about speed and the speed of the operations, the speed that concerns me was the collapse of the Iraqi military in the vicinity of Mosul and then en route to Crit. This is a major line of communications. You have to control this if you're eventually going to get to Baghdad, right. conducting operations from this, from this location. So once you gain some speed vis-a-vis -vis the enemy, right. it's all about momentum, and you're not going to stop. And that's what we see right now is ISIS increasing its rate of momentum. While only 3.5% of Muslims consider themselves followers of Wahhabism, the movement is considered to be one of the most extreme and fundamental of all Islamic beliefs. Al-Qaeda is considered one of the most dangerous terrorist organizations in the world and is a major supporter of Wahhabism and Sharia law. The organization START conducted an analysis of terrorist attacks around the world in 2012 and concluded that over 8,500 terrorist attacks killed almost 16,000 people. Six of the seven deadliest terror groups that year were affiliates of Al-Qaeda. As the country of Iraq descends into collapse, we take a look into how this was all started. U.S. or U.N. forces should have moved into Baghdad? No. Why not? Because if we'd gone to Baghdad, we would have been all alone. There wouldn't have been anybody else with us. It would have been a U.S. occupation of Iraq. None of the Arab forces that were willing to fight with us in Kuwait were willing to invade Iraq. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. These are opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. More than 35 countries are giving crucial support, from the use of naval and air bases 
to help with intelligence and logistics to the deployment of combat units. Every nation in this coalition has chosen to bear the duty and share the honor of serving in our common defense. Uh, once you got to Iraq and took it over and took down Saddam Hussein's government, then what are you going to put in its place? That's a very volatile part of the world, and, and if you take down the central government in Iraq, you can easily end up seeing pieces of Iraq fly off. People have been gathering in Salmani as main square for nearly three months now, protesting what they allege is government corruption, nepotism, incompetence, and anti-democratic measures. Since then, at least 12 civilians have been killed across Iraqi Kurdistan, as military forces of the ruling parties were deployed in the restive areas. The protests and the accompanying violence have pushed the government and the opposition parties further away from each other than ever. Masoud Barzani, the president of the region, recently accused the opposition of trying to stage a coup, an accusation that is vigorously rejected. The other thing was casualties. Uh, everyone was impressed with the fact that uh, we were able to do our job with as few casualties as we had. But for the 146 Americans killed in action, and for their families, it wasn't a cheap war. And the question for the president, in terms of whether or not we went on to Baghdad and took additional casualties in an effort to get Saddam Hussein, was how many additional dead Americans is Saddam worth? And our judgment was uh, not very many, and I think we got it right. When the United States invaded Iraq, it left a major power vacuum that it could not fill. After many attempts at stabilizing the Iraqi military and government, U.S. forces left the country in 2011. Sectarian violence rose to an all-time high, creating an uncontrollable environment for the Iraqi security forces to maintain. Following the civil war in 2011 and destabilization of its neighbor Syria, Iraq would fall victim to the same fate of its northern neighbor just a few years later. ISIS has a bankroll of over $2 billion, making it the wealthiest jihadist group in the world. During the ISIS invasion of Iraq, they looted the Iraqi Central Bank, where they gained much of their wealth. The question still remains. Who was funding the organization before the Iraqi invasion? And why did Al-Qaeda break its ties with ISIS? Al-Qaeda has cut ties with an affiliate it says is too extreme. The terror group says it's not responsible for what the Islamic State of Iraq and Al-Sham is doing in Syria. It's surprising in a sense because ISIS claims allegiance to Al-Qaeda. An expert on militant Islam at the Brookings Institution put it this way to the New York Times. ISIS is now officially the biggest and baddest global jihadi group on the planet. Nothing says hardcore like being cast out by Al-Qaeda. Still, it's a move that's likely been in the works for some time. As a writer for the Daily Beast notes, the group has been known to disobey. One of the reasons for the disavowal may be that al-Baghdadi's defiance was beginning to threaten al-Zawahiri's authority. But this is a jihadist group so extreme, even al-Qaeda wants nothing to do with them. We're in a pretty scary place if al-Qaeda is disavowing people for their violence. As these graphic photos show, in recent months, the group has executed enemies in Syria and then staged their deaths to look like crucifixions. And ISIS is apparently looking to the future, openly recruiting young boys and running schools to radicalize Syria's next generation. The Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant, otherwise known as ISIS, has threatened to leave the city of Aleppo to the Assad regime unless rival rebel groups stop their attacks against the Al-Qaeda-affiliated group within 24 hours. An alliance of rebel forces calling themselves the Army of Mujahideen have reportedly inflicted significant losses against ISIS in recent days as more moderate rebels try to retake the initiative from ISIS, which stands accused of imposing a reign of terror on territory it controls. Syria's main opposition movement, the Syrian National Council, yesterday endorsed their fellow rebels' fight against ISIS and called on all Syrian rebels who have joined the al-Qaeda-linked group to abandon it and for ISIS leadership to be prosecuted. ISIS is led by Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. He was once captured by American forces and spent four years in Camp Bukha in Iraq and was released in the year 2009. The U.S. did not consider him dangerous upon his release, but investigators have found very little information on who al-Baghdadi is, earning him the nickname The Ghost. He is an educated man with university degrees in Islamic studies and history. When or where he became radicalized is still unknown. His political ties and affiliations are also unreported, but a simple examination of his group's funding quickly reveals who is backing ISIS.
And although it only represents a tiny minority of Muslims, its believers are far from minorities themselves. A majority of the world's Wahhabis are from Qatar at 46%, the United Arab Emirates at 44%, and Saudi Arabia at 22%. These three countries represent some of the wealthiest Islamic states in the world, with Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates coming in the top two GDPs at over a trillion dollars a year combined. They also have some of the largest concentrations of Sunni Muslims who only make up about 22% of all Muslims worldwide. These three countries are also supposed allies of the United States and share a similar disinterest in Syrian President Bashar al-Assad and the Iranian government. The Council on Foreign Relations reports most of ISIS's financing comes from smuggling, extortion, and other crimes. ISIS is even cashing in on oil, selling crude from oil fields they took control of in northern Syria right back to the Syrian government. The New York Times reports ISIS is also selling electricity from captured power plants back to the government, too. They also do a lot of the traditional terrorist fundraising activities, kidnapping, robbing, thieving. Involved, they're involved in the drug trade. They have money laundering schemes. In the Daily Beast, Josh Rogan reports that ISIS has also been funded for years by wealthy private donors living in countries the U.S. considers allies countries like Kuwait, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia, and that those governments, says Rogan, know it's happening but choose to look away. The governments could have some plausible deniability and say they weren't funding them directly. At the very least, they were looking the other way. Now back to the numbers. If you do the math, ISIS may be worth at least $500 million after that last attack on that bank in Mosul. In 2011, the Taliban was said to be worth an estimated $70 million to $400 million. Even Al-Qaeda can't compete. Al-Qaeda had an operating budget of about $30 million a year before the 9-11 attack. And all of this cash on hand only allows ISIS to attract more extremist fighters who are drawn to higher salaries. Big money also helps ISIS finance large-scale prison raids liberating hundreds of fighters who then join their rank. With a professional terrorist army with seemingly unlimited funds and backed by some of the wealthiest Arab countries in the world, the future of Iraq seems to be in question. Currently, the United States has deployed a few hundred Marines to secure the embassy in Baghdad and has hundreds more sitting in the Gulf. President Obama has ordered up to 275 Marines back into the war-torn nation of Iraq. Military members ordered back to the country will be equipped for combat, according to official records. This follows gains made by the armed groups in the country, including a takeover of Mosul, the second largest city in Iraq. The government of Iran offered to assist Washington in military strikes against the militants, and this prompted the first discussions in a decade between the nations over a common security interest. While pundits discuss the future of Iraq from air-conditioned studios, Many countries are appealing to the United States for intervention, including Iraq's own prime minister. Iraq's Shiite-led government has formally asked the United States to launch airstrikes against Sunni Muslim insurgents who have engulfed the country in fighting and battled their way into Iraq's biggest oil refinery. In a televised address, Iraq's prime minister called for his country's tribes to fight back against the Sunni militants. Kurdish Peshmerga troops have joined the effort to defeat the advance, although they're focused on securing the Kurdish region to the north. The insurgents have their sights set on Baghdad to the south. These militant fighters are led by the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, which aims to build an independent Sunni Muslim emirate in the region. ISIL's surge may pose the biggest security threat to Iraq since the sectarian bloodshed that followed the U.S.-led invasion to oust Saddam Hussein in 2003. And in a bizarre twist of fate, Iran, a longtime enemy of the United States, has expressed interest in working with the U.S. on a solution to help end the violence in Iraq. Iran holds an overwhelming Shia majority of 87 percent, as does Iraq with 61 percent. Iran has long expressed interest in having closer ties with Iraq since the overthrow of Saddam Hussein in 2003. Iran also has a security pact with Syria, which is why the United States has been funding Al-Qaeda-affiliated groups with weapons and money to fight its proxy war in Syria. 
can the U.S. ally with Iran to defeat ISIS, an organization armed and partially funded by CIA operations in Syria? Or is the conflict of interest too great for the United States to take assistance from its long-standing enemy Iran? As the fate of Iraq hangs in the balance between forces it seems to have little control over, only time will tell if the world can intervene on its behalf or watch as Iraq is destroyed from the outside in. Wow, what a mess. The Meyer information in Contact 251 talked about the rat catcher or the Pied Piper, which this, and Billy has now stated that this leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS, is the rat catcher or the Pied Piper. He's funded by some of the wealthiest countries, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates. Some say there are groups in the West funding this group ISIS, which is worse than Al-Qaeda, they say. On June 29, 2014, the group ISIS claimed itself to be a worldwide caliphate. Now, a caliphate is a Muslim governing body, so to speak. It's kind of an Islamic political religious leadership, which centers around a caliph. Now, the caliph in this case is this Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who is supposed to be the succeeder of the Islamic prophet Muhammad. And they are intending to create a caliphate or an Islamic state. Islamic state um, would be kind of a, a religious dictatorship. You know, the Meyer material talks of, about the fact that we live in a consciousness condition tyranny. We are in a tyranny here on the earth, and it's a t- tyranny related to our level of awareness, to our consciousness. And this is an example of one of the extreme religions that is literally enslaving the consciousness of this whole group in the Middle East and is turning them to violence. Now, there's a huge blow for coalition forces now because ISIS is now capable of bringing down aircraft. Islamic State terrorists have reportedly brought down a U.S.-led coalition fighter jet in northern Syria. Now, that's according to the London-based Observatory for Human Rights, but the claim hasn't yet been confirmed by the coalition. Let's cross to our Middle East correspondent, Paula Sleer, for the very latest. Paula, um, at this point, what more can you tell us? Well, ISIS does claim to have shot down a Jordanian warplane from the American-led anti-ISIS coalition over northern Syria. ISIS saying that they've captured the pilot. Now, the family has, in fact, confirmed this. We understand that he's a Jordanian national by the name of Muath Kasabeh. ISIS-affiliated media is flooded with pictures of the alleged pilot surrounded by 11 masked militants who seem to be celebrating his capture. As you say, no confirmation yet from coalition forces. True, this incident would suggest that ISIS has has come into possession of some fairly sophisticated anti-aircraft weaponry. Do you think this could throw the whole airstrike strategy into doubt? Well, there have been rumours for the past three months at least of ISIS acquiring advanced anti-aircraft missile systems. And certainly if this is true, and the incident now does seem to suggest it, that ISIS is able to bring down planes, this is a huge blow for the coalition. The current coalition strategy has been heavily criticised for being flawed and overly expensive. The Pentagon has confirmed that the airstrike campaign has significantly surpassed the $1 billion mark. Now, critics of the airstrike campaign, including the Syrian President Bashar Assad also say that it violates the integrity of a foreign country. Critics also say that ISIS controls the same territory as it did before the airstrikes, raising the question, of course, of how effective these airstrikes indeed are. Okay, thanks for bringing us the latest. That correspondent, Paul Asleer, reporting live from Tel Aviv. Well, the Meyer material explains that there is no religious deity these religions of the world today focus on very many religious deities 
uh, the Meyer material says there is a universal consciousness, and Semyasi described it this way. She said that love and wisdom go together, and that the creation and its laws are love and wisdom at the same time. The creation is another term used to describe the universal consciousness. Uh, the universal consciousness builds universes as a part of its own evolution. It creates the human spirit in order to aid it with its own evolutionary process. Now, there have been many names for God over the years, and monotheism can be traced all the way back to the Egyptian era of Atenism. Now, Aten was considered the supreme being, and this goes back to about 1350 B.C. And Aten was the god of Atenism. And in some senses, Atenism was the worship of the sun disk, but not merely the sun disk, but also light, which was said to emanate from this god. So we can trace monotheism all the way back to Egypt, 1350 B.C., with the rise of Aten. Now, it's interesting that Amenhotep IV changed his name to Akhenaten because he b became a, a believer in Aten. And as I've described many times in my radio show here, that the Meyer material says there was an extraterrestrial group on the Earth, a splinter group of the Pleiaren, far below the Giza Plateau. They were called the Giza Intelligences. And they used religions to deceive the people of the Earth. And if it's very interesting, but if you look at this term, Aten, sounds very similar to Allah, or very similar to Allah being the term that's used in Islam for God. And uh, Adonai is the term used in Judaism for God. Now, this concept of the creation is not a religious deity. But the Meyer material says, in ancient times, there were extraterrestrial human beings on the earth. And some of them were considered kings of wisdom. And the word J-H-W-H is often translated on earth as God. And the J-H-W-H, or the Ishwish, are first talked about in Contact Report 5. Now the reason that I'm talking about monotheism now and the history of religion on earth, because it all ties into the massacre in Palestine that we started the show talking on about, and it also deals with the rise of ISIS. Remember, the Meyer material says, we are living in a consciousness-conditioned tyranny, and our consciousness is our level of awareness. And when something is conditioned, it, it's being changed for a specific use. And if people are involved in these extreme religions, they are subject to what the Meyer material refers to as the God delusion insanity. And the God delusion insanity is a kind of psychosis that's not too far from schizophrenia or even epilepsy, where people go through these serious bouts of violence and various strange behavior. And we're seeing this in ISIS, who, th who think that they are being led by God and who think that they are doing this holy jihad over the world. They think they're doing the right thing. And in this case, the right thing involves beheading and, and massacre. And this is the product of this kind of insanity that grips people when they get involved in these bizarre religions. Now, I played a lot of clips today. I'm just not 
I'm in a funny mood this evening. I just didn't feel like talking much for whatever reason. But um, I will be on at 8 p.m. Eastern this evening on freedomslips.com, Studio B, and I'll be talking to Dr. Richard Allen Miller. And we've got a lot of very interesting things to discuss this evening. Hopefully, I'll be on tomorrow talking about the Meyer material as well. Thanks for joining me. Hope you have a good evening. Hope you can join me on freedomslips.com, Revolution Radio. Um, got a couple good guests. And thanks for listening. And we'll be back. Mm-hmm.